The Real Investment Show. Um, there's a shocking news headline out today that people with substance abuses are having breakthrough cases on COVID. And, 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 yeah, no kidding. It's because your immune system's weaker. So, but these are all kind. Of, but all these headlines are weighing on the markets, right? It's COVID. It's Delta. It's this. It's that. Um, you know, but you know, everybody kind of forgets that we we're, were up 20 percent this year. Um, back in June and July, and you know, you're yep. having a five percent correction here, and and people are acting like you know the world just came to an end. No, that, that that's right. You know, it's it's so difficult right now to make these decisions. You know, I equate it to kind of being in a purgatory to some extent. You know, market technicals haven't broken out one way or the other, so we're just kind of waiting to see. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it makes those decisions that much more difficult because you're almost always wrong while you're waiting. Um, yet, you know, the likelihood that we could we could go either way is, I mean, I don't know what you would call it. Would you call it 50-50 or would yeah. you, um, <laughs> you know? Yeah, pretty much it's 50-50. It's going to go one way or the other. I mean, there's, it's only going to go in two directions. So, well, and, and, and But that's a good point. So, you know, you don't want to completely miss it, but you also don't want to take the full blow of it if things were to right. deteriorate and go further down. So, which is why it's a good reason to have some cash if you are, you know, allocating funds, not to allocate every single dollar you have, leave some back that way. You know, if it does go the, the opposite direction, you can't take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's the key for many is that we're seeing a lot of people who it's it's all that all or nothing strategy. And most most places operate like that. That's just the easy way to do it because you you never know which way it's going to go. And if somebody tells you that, like I'm getting a lot of calls like Danny, what's what's going to happen here? And say, look. Here's what we think. This could go this way. It could go this way. Here's what we're going to do in both scenarios. But if somebody tells you they know exactly what's going to happen, you need to run the opposite direction because they're full of it. <laughs> well, no, I mean, and this, but uh, again, you know, you kind of listen to the financial media. They tell you every day it's, you know, markets are down today because of higher interest rates or markets down today because this, well, you know, higher interest rates certainly are, are coming up here, but they're not higher than they were just a couple of weeks ago. Actually, rates have come down here a bit. So, you know, we're, yeah, we're seeing rates move up because there's concerns over the debt ceiling and the default issue. So bond traders are repositioning, but that'll resolve itself fairly shortly one way or the other. They're going to raise the debt ceiling. It's just a function of either do they bust the filibuster to, to do it or do the Democrats just get it together and push it through on a reconciliation basis. So, you know, it's but it's going to get done. It's just a question of when. And, you know, so but yep. markets are trying to adjust for the just in case part. And that makes it difficult for longer. And, and again, it's this problem between being a longer term investor and what, you know, Wall Street is doing internally uh, on a day to day basis to adjust for things. And, you know, it's, it's you know, people are making the assumption that, well, interest rates can only go higher from here. And that's not the case. Um, but that's what it seems like at the moment. And so we, we tend to, to convolute these very short term periods of volatility with longer term outcomes for the market, which isn't necessarily the case. Well, I think people need to understand is exactly what you just said is Wall Street invests money much differently than you do. And their goals are much different because they are reporting to shareholders. They have so many different uh, things that they have to account for. And they have to do so on a on a daily, a weekly, a, a quarterly basis so that they can account for these things. Whereas you don't, your, your lifespan is much different. You're running a marathon when many times these guys are running sprints because they know they need to get to the next quarter, to the next quarter. And that's how these guys are paid as well. I mean, you look at all the stock buybacks. We look at all the things that have occurred over the years. You can't go do that to, to impact that. Now, you can put money aside, and that's great, and continue to buy and invest. But, you know, to try to equate these things, and I think one thing that's happened, and you've talked about this frequently, is the gamification of Wall Street for the retail investor. That's not necessarily a good thing. Right. Well, no, it's not because, uh, you know, it's – you know, as investors, we should be long term, and that is the goal. And the you know the average holding time for stocks back in the 1970s was around six to eight years. Now we're down between five and six months uh, as the average holding period. And for a lot of people, it's a lot shorter than that. So, you know, it's always interesting to me. You see all these articles written about being a buy and hold investor. How are you supposed to be a buy and hold investor when people are turning things over every five to six months? Right. You know, it's it's yeah. it's it's this it's this real break between what 
you know, financial advisory firms and Wall Street is telling you to, they want you to buy and hold because they get to charge you a fee for the assets under management. So they don't ever want you to sell. But the rest of the world is trading all around you constantly and, and trading on a very fast basis between five and six months. So, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to be this long term buy and hold investor in a market where everybody else is trading all around you. Well, and that's all you hear, you know, in the day to day headlines, like you mentioned, CNBC, yeah. anything, anybody else is, you know, oh, run for the hills. The market's <laughs> down. And like, wait a second, the market's down 5%. We've been expecting this. We've talked about this. Yeah. And, you know, this is a, the normal realm of, of what may or may not occur. You know, it's, you know, you write your technique speaking each and every Tuesday. And yesterday I had some comments like, well, you know, Lance, it sounds like there's a 10% uh, decline that's imminent. And I had to kind of, we talked through it and said, well, look, there's always a 10% decline that's imminent. Each and every year, we typically see something of that nature. Now, when you start looking at technicals, we can start making the case that one is, is much closer. Yep. I mean, there's different times where, you know, we're closer to one than not. And this is probably one, um, you know, certainly for this year. Uh, again, it's, it's important to try to keep this into some perspective. We were up 20% for the year. An average year, and this is the one, you know, every, you know, advisors throw this out all the time too. It's like the market returns an average of 8% a year. I've seen a bunch of ads on social media and, and websites talking about my, my IRA returns 8% a year. No, it doesn't. That's and the people that are promoting that are completely lying and say just invest with you know this XYZ robo advisor and you're gonna get eight percent a year on your Roth IRA. That's not true at all. Um, you may average over a very long time eight percent, but there's a very different outcome of an average of eight percent and actual eight percent returns. So you know, this is this is part of what we talked about. In fact, we wrote about this on Monday, talking about is the best way to invest always the best way to invest. And you know, it's important to keep in mind that some years markets do very well. And we're having a year where the market's doing very well. Again, just from perspective here, even if we have a 10% decline from the peak, right, we're still going to be up more than the average return for any given market year going back to 1900. So, you know, it's important to keep this into perspective. Yeah, it sucked lately to, to be in the markets. It's, it seems like this market just won't stop selling off. Every day the market's down. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how every day the market just seemed like it was going up and just throw money in the market. It just goes up every day. And this is how fast our emotional sentiment changes. Um, just in a couple of weeks, we've completely forgotten about the first half of the year where it seemed like nothing would ever go wrong. And now it seems like nothing can go right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, it's amazing how quick our, you know, the emotional side of these things can change. Right. And you're supposed to buy and hold, remember. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's, but that's the whole, the whole point of all this. So, you know, one thing that we, we need to kind of uh, cover today is talking about, there's some, talking about, you know, my IRA will return 8% a year and this type of stuff. There are some changes coming up to the Roth IRA. So when we come back after the next break, I, I do want to kind of get in some of those because, you know, this is one of the areas that we've talked about a lot is that when, you know, we're talking about Roth IRA conversions and using Roth IRAs to build tax-free savings, that, you know, those are potentially coming under a bit of pressure here because of, well, this, this kind of goal of the government to try to start taxing people more money because they want to try to figure out a way to pay for all their spending. You know, so it's got to come from somewhere. And one of the big concerns has always been, Roth IRAs and and that tax-free growth that's sitting there, of course, it doesn't help when you have guys like Peter Thiel, um, you know, walking around with a billion dollars in his Roth IRA. <laughs> that that doesn't help the cause any, but that's a very small number of people relative to the total number of Roth IRAs out there. So I did want to kind of come back and talk about some of those Roth IRA, Roth IRA changes that are coming um, and potentially what impact that might make. And maybe what some alternatives to creating tax-free income are that maybe, A, aren't looked at that much by individuals because there's something they don't know about or simply just something that doesn't get talked about enough. But in you know, are these other alternatives also at risk of overreach by government at some point if people start figuring out how much money is actually hiding in these other areas of tax-free income that aren't as widely known and maybe our government politicians aren't aware that they exist or maybe it's because they have most of their money in those products <laughs> we'll see which ones are going after we'll talk about that when we come back after the break with danny ratliff don't go away
Danny Ratliff joining me this morning. So, Danny, we have our infamous, famous Right Lane Retirement Workshop coming up in Austin week after next, right? Yes, sir. Two weeks, October 16th. It's going to be at the Westin at the Domains. It's uh, it's one of those deals where we're talking about all of the things that really impact retirement. And especially right now in this day and age, you know, we, we want to talk about taxes and what's the overall impact going to be to you, your portfolio, the longevity of it. What does that do to your financial plan? Right. And, you know, there's a lot of other things right now that, that we have to keep into account. Inflation, what does that look like? How do you invest in this type of market? Um, and so lots of really good information. This is one of our, our most or well-attended classes. Uh, love to see you guys out there. Go to realinvestmentadvice.com, sign up there. We keep it very, very informal. There's no product selling. It's just really informational. And we want to tell you, you know, the things that you should be considering right now and things that may impact you for a long period of time. Yeah. And again, it's, it's, it really is a lot of good information. And, and, you know, everybody that goes to the class always comes away with a lot of good comments and, you know, a lot of insights where they go, ah, I didn't even know that. So it's and, and particularly we talk about things, you know, that y'all cover such as, you know, what's happening with Roth IRAs. And as, and as we said before the break, one of the topics you'll talk about is the, the upcoming changes to Roth IRAs, uh, right. just at a high level, kind of what do you, what's coming down the pipeline from the administration as they try to find more ways to tax people. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of stuff. And, you know, this is one thing that's so difficult, Lance, because it's changing weekly. We tried to make some slides for the last retirement right lane, and it was so difficult because by the time you put something on paper, it would change. <laughs> and that's likely still going to be the case while they're finalizing all these things. So Section 138.311, yeah, imagine that, 138,311. Yeah. That sounds like a really good bill that I'm sure everybody has read. <laughs> um, so so they're actually looking to eliminate all Roth conversions for high-income taxpayers. And so what that would mean, and so most people say, well, that's no big deal. But what it does is it's going to be that trickle-down effect at some point. So they're looking to eliminate. So if you're single, uh, if you make over 400000 or if you're married filing jointly with 450000 in income, they're looking to eliminate that Roth conversion element. Also, if you hold over $10 million inside of an IRA, they want you to start making distributions because you have too much money. Right. Man, good, good for you. Pat you on the back. You did a good job. You actually saved money. And you're not going to be a burden on the system. But by the way, we're going to need you to go ahead and get that money out. Yeah. So what that would mean is if you had a, let's say you had a $15 million account, you would actually be required to take an RMD of $2.5 million that year because they want you to get these funds out. Right. Um, now, the interesting element of this is that well, they're going to eliminate these Roth conversions, but they're not doing so, at least so far in this proposal, until December 31st of 2031. So they're going to give you a 10-year time frame to go ahead and get these funds out. So you can have a fire sale. Yeah. Now, you know, this $3.5 trillion bill they're looking to push through, you know, on top of the other ones. Don't worry, they're not going to cost you anything. Well, they are going to cost you something. They're not going to cost the government something because they're going to raise taxes. And that's why they're keeping this little window of time, because yep. this is the way they can fast track it to go ahead and do so. Now, the other element of this is that they're looking to eliminate the backdoor Roth by essentially saying that you're no longer going to be able to put after tax dollars into a traditional IRA and then convert it. So these are two bigger things that we're seeing right now. We're also seeing for somebody who holds a self-directed IRA. Um, there's going to be a prohibited transaction that, you know, currently, you know, you talked about Peter Thiel and the money that he has in the Roth IRA, how he was able to go out and buy PayPal, even though he was, uh, you know, had a, an investment in the company. Well, currently, as long as that investment is 50% or less of the overall company or your, you know, sort of certain other elements to it, you can do so. Um, you can invest in, in privately held companies. They're looking to change that and, and lower that threshold to 10%. And so, therefore, eliminating a lot of people, the ability to go out and invest in their own companies or businesses. And this is going to impact a whole slew of other investments as well. So, you know, what we're seeing are things that we've been concerned with. You know, you've mentioned how they're going to attack the Roth IRA here at some point. Um, the key is, as long as you don't have over $10 million, um, you're going to be okay, right? Well, and I think that, that's most people. Well, let's see, but that's, that's the interesting part about this, right? It's the slippery slope. And this is what we've seen going back to when we started messing around with debts and deficits and Social Security and, and you know, a whole variety of other things all the way back in the 70s is that once you start this, right, and then once politicians go, hey, you know, 
we put that did that on $10 million. If we move that down to $8 million, look how much more money we would get. If we move that down to $6 million, and that's the problem is that, you know, they they once you approve this, and yeah, it doesn't affect me right now. You know, people go back and they talk about, you know, back in the 19 19- you know, 40s, 50s, we had a 90% tax rate. Yeah, it was on 5 million income. Literally no one paid that tax rate of 90% back in the, yep. in, in the mid-century, right? It, but it's that slippery slope that you start that process on, and it, it opens up a lot of other potential boondoggles down the road as, as to, you know, getting people to save money. And look, let's go back to the basic premise of all this. The whole point and this is the thing that our politicians miss. The whole point of getting people to save tax-deferred money or tax-free money what, is to get them to save, period. Give them an incentive to save. You take And we, we've talked about statistics here on the show. The average person has less than one year's salary saved up. So we need more people to save more money so they won't be dependent almost solely on Social Security, Medicare. Medicare is going to be, I just saw a chart out this morning, Medicare is going to run out of money in like six years. So, you know, it's just, it's, this is just this dependency. And of course, now we're putting more and more people every time we have, you know, illegal immigrants come across or we have some other, you know, population that we immigrate for one reason or another, we stick them on Social Security, right? We keep tapping that bucket of money for all these other programs, kids, elderly, sick. And, and look, there's legitimate reasons to do that. I'm not saying that, but we keep using this one bucket of money to, to fund all these other things that it wasn't ever meant to fund. It was supposed to be just a social security issue once you get into retirement. And by the way, you were never meant to live to 90 years old. <laughs> you were supposed to die at 65. And you know that's the whole actuarial table has been completely skewed. So you know we keep disincentivizing people to save money so we can spend more money in government on programs that really don't benefit anybody long term. Well, that's right. The pools are continuously getting bigger and bigger, but yet, you know, where we're pulling from or, you know, the things that that need to be, uh, uh, you know, put into it is getting smaller. And that's the biggest problem here. Like you mentioned, I mean, yeah. when you look at immigration, when you look at I mean, we could go we could spend a whole lot of time on all of these issues. And, you know, they all need to be more thoughtful. And unfortunately, we need to do a better job of spending money. So like you mentioned, oh, no, you know what? We shouldn't balance a checkbook. We should just go tax people more or yeah. take more money from other areas. You know, the, the thoughtfulness of this is is astounding, really. Well, um, and it's only getting worse. Well, it's just it's just the whole issue of the debt ceiling, right? Everybody's like, why don't we just get rid of the debt ceiling? Well, we should, right? Because if you're not going to pay attention to it, might as well get rid of it, right? Um, right? But the whole point of the debt ceiling was to have a credit limit for the government. It was to say, look, you're not supposed to spend more than this. And once you get to this limit, you're supposed to cut your spending. And it's like, well, we can't cut spending. We just got to raise the debt limit. This is essentially you coming home to your wife and your wife says, honey, I've spent all the money in the bank account and the credit cards are maxed out and I need to go buy some more shoes. And so you go get another credit card. You know, instead of saying, no, you can't have the shoes, (laughs) we got to go pay off the debt. And, and I'm not talking about your wife specifically. So yeah, you know, know. Michelle, Michelle, don't get mad at me. I'm not talking about it's it's, it's the ubiquitous wife, right? <laughs> or, or or husband, either one. You know, new shotgun, new golf clubs. It doesn't matter. The, it's the example. Yep. Nobody get offended here. But the point is, is that you're you get to this point to where you know logically you should say, hey, you know what? I'm completely tapped out. I need to probably think about where I'm spending my money, versus you know just going to get another credit card because that's all we're doing. And I know that seems like a very simplistic analogy, but that's essentially what the debt ceiling is supposed to be for, is to provide some fiscal sanity to Washington. And we threw that out the window 78 times ago. Now this will be the 79th time that we raise the debt ceiling. Yeah, and you talk about that slippery slope. We're already seeing that in action right now with the estate tax, with capital gains. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that all across the board. And so it's not like we haven't seen this, this same thing play out before. It's just taking place with something different. And once you allow them to start tapping into different areas, they're going to continue to do so. So you mentioned, like, where do, where do people put funds? How can we get around this? And so some of the things that we see is, uh, and, and we've talked about this frequently. I feel like we've talked about this a lot more this last year because yeah. it, it has become even more, you know, kind of in the in the spotlight as something that's needed is looking at permanent life insurance. I mean, that's been a way that it's still, it's still able to utilize this. And I don't think they've caught on to it yet. It's kind of weird, you know? So maybe they all have these permanent life insurance policies. We need to go through their financial (laughs) records. But 
you know, that is that is that is something that is still stood the test of time as something that you can invest. So if you do so smartly and utilize this as a way to, to distribute some tax free income or make make some distributions. I mean, this is something that may be the last the last thing standing. Well, no, it's, it, and it's very interesting, and it's, you know, I've seen more videos about this lately as well. This has been circulating, you know, social media as well as this. And you got to be careful. And when we come back from the break, we'll, we'll tell you why you need to be careful about what you hear from people. And, and because it's not, it is a very easy solution to create wealth for yourself. But you have to be careful how you do it. There's a lot of traps and pitfalls, and a lot of people will sell you a product that will nece- not necessarily meet the goals you want. So when we come back from the break, we'll talk about what the videos are saying, because it's true, about how really rich people build more wealth by being their own bank. And we'll talk about how to do that for yourself when we come back from the break with Danny Ratliff. Don't go away. Be your own bank. Um if you search the internet for be your own bank and some other terms like that, you're going to find some videos and things talking about how to be your own bank. And it's an interesting process. And it's something that I use personally as well, um, because it does work and it works very well. However, you have to make sure you do this correctly. And a lot of people will, will try to sell you a product that doesn't necessarily fit the structure that you're looking for. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you're going to make a mistake and you're going to buy the wrong product, which is going to wind up costing you money over time. And that's what you don't want to do. So very quickly in a nutshell, permanent life insurance and is is the way that a lot of wealthy people use their money to their advantage. Now, how is how does this work? So I'm just very quickly, I'm going to just hit the highlights. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us on the website. Just simply go to realinvestmentadvice.com, send an email. Happy to help you, um, you know, with the process. And, and Danny can certainly help you as well. But the highlight is simply this, is that with the right type of permanent life insurance policy, you can overfund the policy. Now, again, permanent life insurance gets a bad rap from people like Dave Ramsey. And he says, hey, just buy term life insurance and, you know, invest the rest. And that's, in, in theory... That's correct. That would work. Um, but you lose some benefits, first of all. But the second thing is, is that the problem is that people buy term life insurance because it's cheap and then they don't invest the difference. They spend the difference. <laughs> and so when they need life insurance down the road in 30 years, the policy is expired worthless and you have no savings. And now you don't have life insurance either. So what permanent life insurance does is that, A, it forces you to have life insurance long term and B, it forces you to save money because you've got to pay for that premium long term. And so, yes, it does impose some fiscal discipline. But if you just pay the premium, permanent life insurance will give you permanent life insurance. And that's exactly what you're going to get for it. If you buy a car and you only pay the car note and you drive the car, that's exactly what it's going to do, right? But there's a hidden benefit in permanent life insurance where you can overfund the policy. That money falls into a cash bucket that has an annual premium attached to it. And that income stream, that interest rate that is on that bucket is derived from the policy membership. It's not tied to the markets. It has nothing else going on with the stock market or interest rates or yields or anything else. It's a function of your return from the other policy members that are part of that insurance company. That interest rate applies to your total over cash funded balance. So let's say you've overfunded the account by $100,000 and is yielding 4% a year. Now I'll tell you how I use my policy. So I overfund my policy, been doing it for years. And I get about 4% a year, 5% a year, depending on what's going on in interest on that cash balance. I can then, I then borrow from that policy to go make investments into real estate or whatever else I'm going to invest money in. The key is two things. One, when you make that investment, it has to be something that has a return of principal function attached to it or underlying collateral like real estate. So that you always have a value. You don't invest, you don't take money out of your policy to invest in the stock market. That's stupid. Um, (laughs) But I I create a spread between my interest rate that I gain of 4%. And when I borrow, I'm going to borrow it somewhere around 3, 4% for the money. Um, I borrow that money out and I invested it 9 or 10 or 11 or 12%. And so I capture the spread on the money that I'm using. However, the interesting thing is if I have, 
uh, let's put a bigger number. Let's say I have $500,000 in my cash balance and I borrow $250,000. The balance of my money continues to compound at that 4% a year as if all the money is there, right? It doesn't subtract the 250. The entire cash balance continues to compound at 4% while I've got money out invested at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12%. So I've now created my own bank structure, and the interest rate is tax deductible. (laughs) The best part about all this is, is that cash balance I can withdraw at any time in the future tax-free. So for somebody who's in a higher tax bracket that really funding a Roth IRA for five, what's the the max funding rate right now for a Roth IRA, six grand, Mm 6,500? Yep, not much. Not much. So if I'm making a couple hundred grand a year in income, putting money into a Roth IRA is nothing compared to what I could be saving. This allows me to save a whole lot more money on a tax-free basis with tax-free withdrawals. It is after-tax money going in, just like a Roth, but it comes out tax-free down the road. So, Danny, that's the quick highlight of that. Give us the, give us the things we need to know about that um, people should be aware of. Well, I think you, you, you really did a good job explaining it there. Now, Lance was more specifically talking about a whole life policy. There are other policies that are permanent that you can utilize that still allow you to use that arbitrage. The important thing is, is that there are a lot of really slick people out there, right? <laughs> Very good talkers that are going to say, hey, this is the perfect thing for you. And a lot of times, unfortunately, all they have is a hammer. So everything they see is a nail. And, and what I mean by that is that they may be a captive agent, working for one company and they may get the premise of it correct and the overall big picture, but the, the policies may be lacking one or two little things. And so this is the really important things. So Lance, what, what he was discussing or describing was, you know, looking for a policy that's going to allow you to get some return on what you're going to withdraw down the road. Mm -hmm. And two, you're going to be able to make sure that we, what we want is while that the funds are there with the amount that you take out, you're going to also going to be charged interest on it just like you were taking a loan, which is essentially what you're doing. And that's why it's a tax-free distribution because you're taking a loan from the policy versus actually making a withdrawal. And so it allows those funds to still work, but we wanna make sure that the funds that are still working there, that they're earning more than what the, the interest that they're charging you. And then the icing on the cake is Lance can go out on the other side of this and go invest those funds and make even more money on top of that. So right. hopefully you're looking for a wash. Now, the other thing that's critical is that you do overfund these policies and that you do it on a consistent basis. This is the only way you're going to accumulate any equity in this type of investment because you do have that insurance element to it, which is great. You know, we we look at insurance for many different reasons. And so, you know, the first thing, like Lance mentioned, is the Dave Ramsey approach looking for the term just to cover the risk. Mm -hmm. What happens if something happens to you right now? Now, what Lance is specifically talking about right now is you've graduated from the Dave Ramsey School uh, and now we need to look at something a little bit more sophisticated. And so this is where this type of policy comes in. Now, this is for more accumulation than it is for that death benefit. We still want to use those term policies to cover the risk that you incur. But we want to have a really low death benefit and the lowest that we can have based on you know how much you're going to overfund. Because there is something that's called a MEC, a modified endowment contract. You don't really need to worry about what that means or what what you know the verbiage behind it. But what it does mean for you is that If it becomes a mech, you no longer receive this favorable treatment for distributions down the road when you take them as a loan. So we want to make sure that we get this right and we want to overfund this on a consistent basis. And that's why it's really important when we're we're looking at these. We don't just look at one product. We look at many and we want to scour the earth to determine what's the best one for you based on a number of different factors. Right. And this is an investment that we're going to hold for a very long period of time. So we want to make sure it's one that's going to be there for you. Uh, down the road. Now, we can also use a permanent policy for paying estate taxes. You know, we see a lot of wealthy families utilize this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who maybe have their wealth on paper, but they don't have it in their bank account. This is something that they really need, especially closely held businesses, uh, real estate, things of that nature that allow families to still maintain these things from generation to generation without having to sell everything. And, you know, this new tax code is going to make that a lot more difficult. So I think we're going to see a lot more people utilizing things similar to this, Lance. Right. And look, and, and a lot of wealthy people have money in these types of policies because they're judgment proof. So in, especially Correct. if you're a business owner um, or you have, you're in a, in a, a job that has a lot of potential liability to it, you know, doctors, you know, et cetera. Um, these things 
are, are judgment proof against things like lawsuits and bankruptcies and those type of things. So these assets become protected as well. So there's a lot of benefits. But to Danny's point, you know, you have to you can't just do one thing over the other thing. You need to have, a, you know, a, a well-defined approach to how you're handling, you know, life expectancy and who you're trying to take care of with, you know, your spouse and your children. And, you know, like in my house, you know, I've got a wife, I've got four kids. And uh, for years, I had a term life insurance policy until my whole life policy became large enough that I didn't need the term anymore. So I got rid of that cost. But again, you need to marry these things while you're bridging these spans in time um, with your wealth building process. But these are great ways to build additional wealth, provide asset protection, protect your estate, protect your family, and still build money um, in an environment. And, and again, we see so many things where people are just taking on an exorbitant amount of risk by having all their money into equities because they can't get a return anywhere else. There's some great ways to get returns elsewhere. You just have to be a little bit more creative, and this is what a good financial professional can help you with. Well, that's right. In this environment where we're continuously seeing them tap the piggy bank of your wealth, this is another way to, to help protect that. And I think that's really important. You know, they haven't they have not gone after this as of yet. And I think it's going to be very difficult to do so. And most likely, like a lot of these other things, you'll be grandfathered in if you have something already in right. place. So it's really important to understand how those all these things work together and the implications of it. You know, we talk about the taxes. Look at the stealth taxes on Social Security, on Medicare. I think those are only going to get worse, Lance. I mean, they're not going to get better. Um, you know, these are things that you need to plan for and do so now. Yeah. And the Roth IRA lobby is a lot smaller than the insurance lobby. So that also <laughs> the insurance right. lobby group is huge. <laughs> so <laughs> they'll make sure that your politicians leave those policies alone, most likely. Uh, Danny, thank you so much. Real quick, the event coming up October 16th in Austin at the Domain. Uh, go by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, click on the events link, or there'll be a pop-up banner as well for the Right Lane Retirement Workshop, tax planning changes. Um, if you want to go, love to have you there. Danny and Richard will be there going over all the things you need to know for your re Right Lane Retirement process. Uh, that's on October the 16th at the, at the Dominion in Austin. Simply sign up now. We'll take good care of you. We'll see you then. Realinvestmentadvice.com. See you back here tomorrow. Body, body. Always Sunday in the rich man's world. While the big time is down. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet. Sign up for the Real Investment Report now at realinvestmentadvice.com. It's a rich man's world.